KC Career Services Office, and and we are here. Um, if you didn't know already, I'm, I'm hoping you did. Um, we're here at your service for the rest of your life. Um, you you never get rid of us. We never get rid of you. Uh, we're always here to help you. So um, the topic today is is um, how to make a change when you don't necessarily have a lot of experience in the field that you're hoping to change into. And, and this is something actually we hear a lot from, from alumni um, and, and some of the older students that we work with is how do they make that change. So I thought I'd give some tips and, and, then, um, and then open it up to some questions. And I know people get PowerPointed out, so I don't have a whole lot of PowerPoint slides, but it kind of keeps me on track. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to share a couple slides um, and then a couple examples of some tools and things that you can do to, to sort of showcase what you have for the job that you want. So hold on while I share my screen. Let me see. We'll go on. All right. I hope that you are all now seen. I'm gonna shift this over to my... Um, so how to enter a new field when you um, have experience in a different one. So, you know, it's an interesting topic because for some people they look at this, the shift as being like a big, huge shift. And sometimes we see that like, you used to be an engineer, a mechanical engineer, and working for an engineering firm, and now you've decided, I want to go into advertising. So just like big, huge change. And how do you do that? And you know what? You can. Um, sometimes it's, it's really more of a, a, a slight shift. So maybe it's you've been an engineer, and now you want to move into management, or maybe you want to do project management, um, but you want to stay within the same industry. Um, and so it's something that really builds on your past skills. Um, so it's, it, it can run the gamut. Um, and, and the advice though is largely the same for both. So I'll run through a, a few quick tips and things to be thinking of. Maybe. So my first tip for people is always just relax. Um, it happens all the time. The stat on this is like people will make seven or eight full career changes in their their professional working history. Um, and probably and what they're saying now is that people will have 13 or 14 jobs, uh, different types of jobs, different companies um, in their in their professional lifespan. And you know, in preparation to this, I was actually doing a little looking back on my own career, and and I am I am living up to all of the statistics. I've had fourteen full time professional jobs, uh, and I have had six complete changes. So um, I I know of which I speak, um, but we're I think we're going to see even more of this as we go along. That this is this is. The days that you stay in one job and one career or even one company, uh, I think those are pretty much long gone. So, so relax, it happens all the time. Um, but the, the key to being successful in this is you're going to have to network. And that's never what anybody ever wants to hear. And people, <laughs> I, I know it's not all that fun. And, and I think we have this fear of what networking is um, that isn't really reflective of the type of networking that I'm talking about. So um, if, you're, if you're thinking about making a change, my best advice is to go out and start talking to some people who do the type of work that you want to do. And, and don't go out and, and network with them with the, you know, I'm going to have to ask them to help me find a job or I'm going to have to ask them to hire me. That's not what networking is. Networking is really just being curious about that person, that person's per, uh, career, um, that person's path uh, that they took to get there. And so really it's just starting conversations. And of course, LinkedIn is a great way to start some of these conversations. And when you go to LinkedIn, I think one of the best ways to, to start finding your network 
um, finding these people to talk to is start with UMKC alumni. I think you'll find that most alumni really want to help fellow alumni. So it's a great place to go and um, start looking. Uh, and you'd be surprised in the course of the conversation with them, you can find out things like, will you need to have additional training? Can you make a jump from where you're at to where you want to be? Um, what are some of the, the most important factors in that job that, that you should be thinking about and, and trying to think, okay, how might I talk about my past experience that showcases some of those skills, soft skills, transferable skills? Um, and, and then, you know, you're starting to build these relationships. And I think what you'll find if, if you've done this before, you probably know about what I'm talking about. But, but what you'll find is that a half an hour conversation with somebody where you're, you know, whether it's Zoom um, or whether it's, you know, back when we're back to a somewhat normal world and you're sitting down and having a face-to-face -face conversation, have an hour investment and that person kind of, kind of feels invested in you. Um, they, they start liking you. They start thinking, I want to help this person. Um, and, and usually by the end of those meetings, you know, they're like, well, why didn't you send me a resume? I think you'd be great at something like this. Or a friend of mine who works over at this firm just said that they were going to be doing some hiring. I think maybe you'd be a really interesting fit. I should, you should get in touch with them. I'll make an introduction. So um, the, the first visit, the first informational interview, the first networking contact is usually the toughest. And then it sort of just snowballs from there. So it's my best advice is to network. And, and this will be a recurring theme here for the next few minutes. Um, you know, back before I was saying, what's the change that you wanna make? Is it something that you, you can make that change within your company? So if you're, if you're in that engineering role and you wanna move more into project management, can you, can you do that within your own organization? So often you're a known entity with your own organization. They don't wanna lose you. They'd be much happier shifting you into another role that you might be happier with, that might be a better fit um, rather than, than they lose you. Um, and if they have, and from their perspective, you know, if, if they've got you in your job now and you perhaps are not thinking it's a great fit and you're thinking that you're going to need to leave that position and they've got another open position in project management, if you leave the company, now they've got two open positions. They'd much rather just shift you over and then they, they just have one open position. So, um, so if you can make that change internally, that's great. Now, maybe you're unemployed at this point and, and there's a lot of people out there um, who have, have really recently joined the, the ranks of the unemployed. Um, so maybe you don't have that luxury. Um, although if you left your company in good standing, it's also a great way to get back to your company. Maybe you can reach out to somebody in the company and say, hey, you know, I noticed that now there's a position in project management and they really think I have these great experiences doing some project management elements within my last job and I'd love to talk to somebody about that. And so it might be a way to get back into that company. Um, but maybe it's a situation where you don't want to go back into that company um, or it's a situation where you're, you want to make that big, huge change and leap. Um, so, um, so, but, but, but it's good to identify, you know, can I stay within my own company and still achieve the goals or at least the first step of the goal for the path that I'm looking for, or do I need to, to move externally? Um, and then it's also, you know, the networking can help you with this. We in our office can help you with this. Your own personal research might, might inform you also, but do you need to get additional training? Would you need to have another degree? Would you need to have um, a special certification in order to get a, uh, the position that you're looking for? And, and it's gonna vary. Um, um, don't, don't tell anybody at UMKC that I said this, but very likely you don't need a whole nother degree. 
I know we, we like to, to sell education, and, and it might be that you do, but, but don't automatically assume that if you're making a big change that you have to have a, a new degree to make that happen. Um, I know from my own personal experience, I've been a librarian, I've been in sales, I've worked in marketing, I've done career services, um, and really I didn't need to have a new degree to shift to any of those positions. So, so you can make some pretty big changes without having that additional degree. Now, on the other hand, sometimes you do need to have an, an additional degree. So perhaps you've been working in finance and now you want to become an accountant, a public accountant. Um, you know, you probably are going to have to go and get a degree in accounting in order to do that. Um, obviously, if you want to, if you've been working in marketing and now you want to be an engineer, now you, of course, are going to have to, to go and get a, a degree in engineering. So, um, so sometimes, yes, it's necessary, but sometimes not. Uh, and now sometimes you know, it's just a certification would be more than adequate. Um, I know I recently completed a certification in business analytics, which was super fascinating because I deal with a lot of data and stats in my job. Um, but it's amazing that, that that data, that analytics, that business analytics certification is actually really hot right now. And, and so it makes you a lot more employable also. So that might be something that you might want to think about. Um, if you're if you're making a change, can you can you get by with just certification, or can you get by just by networking and sort of getting yourself out there and and known to some people in the field? Um, and then then my my best advice is is actually about the process of how you would apply for the jobs, and don't. Don't imagine that you're going to just be able to sit at home, look up some jobs on LinkedIn or Glassdoor or Indeed and fire off a few resumes and that you'll find a job in a brand new field because it probably won't work. Even if you're applying for a position within your own field, the response rate is somewhere around one to three percent. So if you send out a hundred resumes or hundred applications, maybe one company will call you for to come in for an interview if you're applying within your own field. So it, it just drops from there to just about zero if you're trying to change positions. And so now I've probably got a whole bunch of people who are like, like whoa, this is really crappy. Um, but, but that's, that stat is based on the fact that most people don't tailor their resume at all for the job that they're applying to. You have one resume, you send it out for everything, you hate writing cover letters, so you opt not to include a cover letter as well. Maybe you have a LinkedIn profile that you haven't touched for years, and, and maybe you don't have a LinkedIn profile at all, and so you apply electronically, and, and nothing happens because, because why would they look at you? So, you know, think about it from, from the, the employer's perspective. Almost all companies these days are using what's called applicant tracking systems. And an applicant tracking system is, is that system that you go in and you fill out all the forms and then you upload your resume. There's also some analytics with in those systems and so it'll scan your resume it's looking for some keywords some key traits that they've programmed in are important for that role it might be a specific type of degree it might be a gpa um, although as you progress past that first job usually gpa doesn't factor in very high um, thankfully for some of us um, but, but it's probably keywords that maybe are pulled directly from the job description are those words showing up in your resume. If you haven't tailored your resume and your resume is all about your engineering experience, but now you're applying for an advertising, you probably aren't coming up as a match for that, that advertising position at all. And so a human being will never look at you. So you need to, find a way to talk about the work experience that you have in a manner that really reflects the job that you're applying to. 
And I like to use the analogy on this one. So think about the, the product Gatorade. I think we all know what Gatorade is, um, the, the energy drink, the sports drink. So Gatorade, it's one product, but when they go and they're trying to market and sell Gatorade to professional coaches, to coaches of, of you know, high level college division one teams, they're out there, they're talking about all the research that's been done on it. It's got all these electrolytes, it replenishes fluids and X amount of time and keeps energy levels up. And, and they're talking about the technical parts of it because they know when they're talking to nutritionists and physical therapists and professional coaches of professional athletes, those things are important. But Gatorade doesn't just sell their product to, to professional coaches. They also sell it to moms and dads who have six-year-old kids. And it's the exact same product. But then they talk about it's got fun colors and fun flavors. And it's got less sugar than pop. And, 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 and they don't talk about anything about electrolytes and fluid replacement because because the parent of a six-year-old probably isn't all that concerned about that. It's the same product, but they're kind of pulling the, the, the things that are relevant to the audience that they're trying to reach. And you kind of have to view your own career strategy when you're applying for a new type of career in the same way. So maybe you've been an engineer, but that doesn't mean that you haven't done any sort of communications. It doesn't mean that you haven't had to create maybe a, 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 a strategy for how you're going to promote a project, how you're going to sell this to upper management. So there's probably elements of the job that you've already been doing that you can talk about, but it's not just all the, the same old engineering jargon. So, um, I'm going to give you a couple examples of, of how you can do this and a great tool and I'll show you how to use that. So, um, so let's, let's, I'll show you some examples. So this is my own resume. People are very squeamish about me using other people's resumes on, as examples. So we'll use my own. Um, this is from several years ago. So you can see on here, I, I've got experience. I had worked at Park University for a couple of years as the director of career services. I worked at the University of Minnesota in the School of Computing and Engineering. Um, no, it's the College of Science and Engineering there. It's, it's the same letters, just a different, different order. Um, um, I've got more experience in, in career services, and then it talks about all my other roles on the second page. But, First page here is relevant. So in this, using this resume, I had planned on applying for a job as a career services director. And I was applying at a place that called their career services the Professional Development Center. So, so in order to tailor my, my really perfect experience for the job that, that I was using this resume for, um, I chose to, you know, first of all, I'm applying to, um, a director position, so my title is a good match. Um, and, and I chose to use the exact words professional development, and in this case planning, to reflect the professional development center, which is what they call their career services. So it's a little bit more sort of banging them on the head that I'm a good fit. Uh, and these bolded subheaders here are exactly are taken from the job description. So they talk about employer outreach and business development. They talked about management and strategy, all being key parts of this position. So I was going to really showcase that, that I had that experience. Now, and you're probably thinking, okay, well, that seems easy because you had been in career services and you're applying for a career services position. So, well, it's not that, that difficult. But at the same time, I was thinking, well, maybe I'd get into training and development because I'd taught classes before and, and I thought maybe that'd be an interesting sort of way to, to utilize some of my skills that I'd had, but um, kind of reinvent myself. So I applied for 
a couple physicians. My experience is the same. My most recent experience at that point was Park University, where I was the director of the Career Development Center. But here now, I'm not showcasing professional development. I'm not talking about resumes. I'm not talking about you know, working with students. I'm talking about training, development, and programming, because that's what the job description. So it's, again, kind of like that Gatorade example. I'm, I'm pulling out the bits of my past that are interesting to the people who are hiring for the position I want. So, so this looks different now. And not every word of here, this is different, not every bullet is different, but it's organized differently, it's marketed differently, and in some cases it's completely new content focusing on why I can do the job that I'm applying for. And again, your, your resume, really get this into your head. Your resume is a marketing document to sell you. It is not a history of what you've done. So think completely about it. like how, how is everything on this one, maybe two pages selling me for the job that I want, not, not telling them what I've done in the past. Um, so, so, you know, if I'm looking at a training and development, these, Things, again, are key things that they said over and over in the job description that they were looking for. So performance development research, management, um, and then, of course, the training and development and programming. So again, tailoring it to the job that you want. Now, I had said before, I used to do marketing, and I love marketing, and I do a ton of marketing in my current job in career services. You might not think it. Um, I tell my staff all the time, Half your job has to be marketing to get students and employers interested in us and using our services. And then, and then it has to be the subject matter expertise to, to provide the information. But if we aren't marketing and selling, then we don't have customers and it doesn't matter how good we are. So we spend a lot of our time in marketing. So if I was taking this same experience again that I had Park University being my most current and I was applying for a marketing position. Now I've changed it a little bit again. So now I'm highlighting the marketing and the business development aspect of the work that I do. I'm, I'm doing um, leadership and performance training um, and again the management. So same position, I just talk about it in different ways. And that's what you really need to do when you're applying electronically um, for some of these jobs so that you can get through those applicant tracking systems and, and be truly evaluated as a candidate. Now, still the best way to get your resume looked at is to network and have somebody in the organization say, hey, I just talked to somebody. Um, I just talked to Katie last week. We had this really great conversation. I think she'd be great here for this position, I think you should take a look at a resume. That's the best way to get your resume looked at. Um, but, but in the case where maybe you don't have somebody inside kind of pulling for you, you really need to do this level of customization in order to get a look. Now, we also here at UMKC have a tool that we use uh, that can help you do some of this customization. And I'm just going to, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and share another one with you, if that's okay. Um, so we have this tool called JobScan, and we pay for a subscription to it. And if you log in with your old umkc.edu address, email address, uh, if you know it, if you don't know it, you can you can contact the school and get it reactivated. Um, but if you log in with your UMKC email, you'll have access to the premium version of this. But even the non-premium version of this job of uh, this website is is a wonderful tool. But the premium is just a little bit nicer. Um, anyway, so job scan, you log in. Um, in this case, I'm just going to show you what a scan looks like. Uh, I'll show you one that I did for my husband a couple of years ago. He was looking for a position. And here we go. So 
what you do is you upload your resume and it converts it to to what the applicant tracking systems converts your resume to and this is kind of an interesting little aside a lot of people do sort of funky weird things with their resume like they'll put little bars on the side and a lot of you know sort of infographic elements they'll add color they'll have interesting bullets don't do that super simple super clean simple super plain that's what recruiters like to see and that's what the applicant tracking systems like to see uh, you'll see once you upload maybe your resume that has a lot of sort of interesting elements to it um, that that it becomes really jumbled when it gets uh, converted to just this really simple text so so here's what my husband's resume looked like when it got converted. Uh, this is not what it looks like normally, but um, still it's, it's fairly clean. And here's the job description he was applying to. And I will say when he read this job description, he was like, this is perfect. This is, this is like made for me perfect job. So we ran a scan to see just how well his resume reflected that he was the perfect candidate for the position. And you know what? Not so much. So the, the, the general theory out there right now is that you need to be at least an 80% match in order to get viewed by a human being. And, and so you can see here, he's not even 50. So he's probably not even close to getting viewed as by a human being. He's, the system is just rejecting his application before it even gets started. So now you could look at that and say, well, I guess I'm not qualified, but that's not actually what this is saying. It's just saying your resume isn't tailored to the job description. And what I love about JobScan is it tells you exactly what you need to do in order to get that better match score and beat the applicant tracking system. So in this case, He's missing a bunch of hard and soft skills that the system thinks are keywords, important things for this job that he should be highlighting. In this case, his job title is a good match. Um, people, if you're a director or an associate, if you have a director in your name, then people like to hire you for a job title that has a director in the name. Um, it's just sort of the way it goes. Um, but can you tweak? your job title a little bit so that it matches better to the job that you're applying to. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can. The education is good match. It's, it's the right length. It's it got some things going for it. Um, but then down here, it'll actually say exactly what he's missing. So in the job description, um, um, you know, it, it uses the word distribution. He never uses that. Um, I don't know what OTT is. Um, he uses the word digital or the phrase digital video. He never mentions it. And it gives you it's quite extensive. You know, he never uses, he says that he has management experience and yet he has extensive management experience. So, so those are some things that he could easily start to fix on his resume. And then some things soft skill it would have been nice if he spoke Spanish, um, if he'd mentioned he was detail oriented. And then some other miscellaneous things that perhaps he could consider adding um, because um, uh, the, you know, they mentioned commercial eight times in the job description and, and he never mentions it. So then all of this should get you thinking, okay, you know, do, I, do I have any experience in my background where I could use the word distribution? So you know, can I talk about um, managed distribution of, of information to project or team members? Um, is there a way you can get the word distribution in, into your resume in a legitimate way? Is there a way that you can talk about digital video? Is there a way you can talk about brands? Did you manage a brand? Did you, did you, uh, were you part of a brand strategy committee? Did you ever consider brand? Something, anything to get that word in there. Um, and then you go to this, and this is the premium part of this. You go to this power edit button. So here's the resume again in its plain text format. 
And here's what it says that I need to add in order to make my resume better. So right now, 49%. And it wants me to add digital video. So um, um, let's see. And I can't think quickly on my feet. But let's say, you know, develop and deliver um, uh, instead of curriculum, let's say digital video here. And now I'm at 52% up from 49. So now let's say product development, um, responsible for, let's say, and product development. And of course, you don't want to lie. Um, but if you can use the words they want to describe what you've been doing, that's not a lie. That's just talking the language that they speak. So now I'm up to 56%. And if I go through this whole list, um, and it's got different sections, and I can keep going, I can get my resume up to 80, 90, 95% match probably. And, and that's going to probably get me at least a phone call for an interview. So applicant tracking systems aren't going anywhere for a while, so you kind of have to play that game. But um, it's for, for career changers, especially, you really need to be playing this game. So the one other thing um, I wanted to and it's, it's, a, it's sort of related to applicant tracking systems, is LinkedIn. And you can use JobScan to optimize your LinkedIn profile also. But if you're trying to change professions, um, it's really important to write your LinkedIn profile for the job that you want and not for the job that you had. <coughs> and, and we can talk a little bit about just how you how you might do that. And much like the resume, it's really just sort of finding a new way to talk about the experience that you have and highlighting those elements of your experience that are relevant to the job that you want. The key things in, in um, LinkedIn that are optimized are this headline right below your name. So you want to make sure that that's really rich with keywords for the job that you have. So again, if I was interested in applying for something that was more program management or um, uh, marketing or sales, then, then I would want to have those words here rather than saying I'm the director of a career center, which is what most people put in this section is they just put their current job title. But if, if I'm not looking for a career center director, job, then, then that's the wrong information to put there. So this is, this is one of the, the most heavily weighted keyword areas within the LinkedIn system, and it's a super optimized system. The next one is this about section, and this is a really critical one if you're job changing. So it's more about what you're interested in and what you are capable of doing than what you have done in the past. So, um, so again, if I was interested in a career services director position, I would probably be talking about, I've worked as a career center for 17 years. Uh, I have experience meeting with students and alumni to assist with resumes and cover letters and interview preparation. And I don't say anything in that, about that here because if, if this is something that I want to use to get into more consulting or business development or marketing or sales, they don't care that I know how to review resumes. But they might be interested in knowing that I've met with hundreds of companies, that I have um, experience um, in how companies um, plan for organizational change, uh, that I know brand strategy. So, so this is about what I'm capable of doing, not necessarily a description of the job that I'm doing now, 
if I want to talk about the job that I'm doing now, there's space down here for that. But, but this is something that you have to be really strategic because while this might be the number one weighted keyword area, this is number two. So, um, so you, you definitely want to make sure those are tailored for the, the job or the industry that you're looking to change to. The other thing that you can do that really adds to your marketability on LinkedIn um, is the skills and endorsements. And the nice thing about this is you get to pick it yourself. So um, you get to add new skills up to 50. I'm at 50, so I don't, yeah, I've already reached my limit. So I, I'd have to, to get rid of something. But here you just type in you know, management experience or digital video experience or leadership or whatever it is that you have to pick things that that really you're kind of learning maybe from job scan are the things that would be important for the job that you want. Um, and if you've had any experience at all doing them, feel free to go in and type them and you it's sort of doubly pointed or doubly weighted so you get some points in this whole scoring system for having the skill and then you get you get another point if somebody has endorsed you for it so so for example i say i, I say i have good leadership skills and 43 people that i know on linkedin have said yes she does um, so so it's the the combination of do you have the, the skills and then and then do you have some endorsements but first just go out and, and put the skills there a good way to get the endorsements is just start endorsing your friends they almost always will turn around and just endorse some a few things on your site also so why it matters is because linkedin has a really good job site a really 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 good job posting site um, but it's not pulling just information from your resume it's also pulling information and keywords from your, your LinkedIn profile. So if you're going to apply for a job through LinkedIn um, and using one of the, the postings that they have on their site, it's important to have your LinkedIn profile optimized just as you would your resume. And, and the nice thing is job scan can actually help you with both. Um, so, anyone have any questions before I talk everybody's ear off? I love this, so I could talk forever. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute. All right, so I do, I probably don't management and marketer and should be. Um, so they're asking if, um if you should be open to maybe taking a step a step backwards if you're changing industries or changing jobs or if my favorite answer and and this isn't very helpful is it depends um sometimes you don't need to i think sometimes people are very quick to think that that of course they'd have to take a step back in order to make that change but not necessarily um But it depends. Um, if it's, you know, if, if say, again, my example is you've been a manager at, uh, of a team for an engineering firm, and now you want to be a manager of brand management at a uh, consumer products good, you, you're probably not going to get that position because that's a big, huge jump. Now, on the other hand, if you are the manager of an IT team, perhaps at uh, an engineering firm, and now you want to move into sort of being a manager of, of some technology team at um, a consumer packaged good, probably you don't need to take a change, uh, any sort of step back there, because, because really it's the management of the technical team and, and you can stay quite parallel, even though the industries are completely different and even though maybe the technologies are different, but the, the management of that technical team is probably pretty similar. 
so it's it's going to depend um, but but don't immediately assume that you have to take a huge step backwards because i think i think you'd be surprised that you don't need to as often as as you might think any other questions There is another question in the chat. Oh, um, to avoid age discrimination, should you change names of organizations where you uh, where you worked to? Yes, um, or um, um, you you actually you have to list it as as the company usually that it is it was at the time you were there but definitely include like in parentheses um currently i i used to work at a, a company that that at the time i was there it was hnc software um so i would list my job as i worked at hnc software but in parentheses i would say currently fico um, because fico has subsequently bought them the nice thing is if I'm applying for a job that maybe is in that industry, um, of course, nobody knows what HNC software is anymore, but FICO probably, you know, if it's a competitor, then that, that probably gives me extra points. Um, at least it's a known entity. Um, if it's age discrimination is alive and kicking and, and it's a really hard one to prove but, it, but it, it's running rampant. So um, don't, don't give them anything they, you don't need to. Um, don't put the year that you graduated if it, if it shows your age. I, I would never put my graduation year for either my master's or my undergraduate degree because you can start doing the math and figuring out, oh, she's a woman in her mid fifties, um, which is not very appealing to many companies these days. Um, so I'm not going to give them the opportunity to to sort of toss my resume before they've even had a chance to meet me. Um, so you don't have to on your resume, you don't have to include everything you've done. I would say 10, maybe, maybe 15 years back is the most I would go back. Um, and, and there are some exceptions to that, but um, yes, and applicant application tracking systems do ask you for for work experience although again in an applicant tracking system you don't need to include everything going back forever um, you do you do need to include the years that you worked there um, but you know i i would never put my first few jobs that i had in my career because again people can start doing the math so i only go back i figure people still like people in their 40s especially women. So, so I'll usually um, put things in an application or in on my resume that might lead people to think that I was perhaps in my 40s. It, it implies that I've got good experience and that I'm, I'm a seasoned professional, but it, it isn't sort of giving that, um, you know, she's, she's getting close to retirement age and so she doesn't care about it and she doesn't have any energy and she isn't creative and, and I hate all of that because I don't believe any of it's true. Um, but, but people, you know, people make assumptions. Um, so I, I would definitely be strategic. Again, don't lie. You don't want to get caught in a lie. Uh, usually that'll get you kicked out of the process immediately. And there are cases where people have lied on applicant uh, applications and on their resume and then had their job taken away from them after they received it once the lie came to light. So don't lie, um, but, but don't, don't overshare. Um, is is my best advice and and for any of these things you know I keep saying it depends and it does it's it's everybody's situation is a little bit unique come in and talk to us like I said we're here to help you throughout your entire career and they I assure you in 17 years I think I've seen pretty much everything um, we're also always talking to employers and so we we do kind of have a finger on the pulse of what people are looking at um, and, and how maybe a company views some of these things. 
You know, another thing that we hear all the time is how do I handle gaps on my resume? Maybe, maybe I, I lost my job because of a pandemic. Um, maybe, maybe I took some time off to take care of family members, either children or aging parents or something. So I have a gap on my resume and how do, how do you handle that? And we can give you tips um, based on what your situation is. And, and we base those tips on, we, we talk to employers, you know, how do you, how do you view gaps? You know, how do you, how do you like it when to have uh, applicants explain a gap um, and and so we will use sort of that that base of information that we get um, in advising you on how to handle these things I'm trying to think, see if I got everybody's questions um, oh um, different approach to job hunting during the pandemic. Um, okay, so you know, you know, I was saying that whole networking thing. Uh, I was actually just this morning on a meeting with the HR advisory board over at the Block School, and so it's it's the senior leadership of the HR departments for some of the major corporations here in Kansas City, and. The, the one theme that one person had said this and everybody jumped on it. More than ever, it's important to network because there are fewer jobs and there's more applicants. And so how do, how do they sort through? How do you know, and think about it. So typically a job gets posted and several hundred people apply to it, not even in a pandemic situation. Now we've got higher unemployment. So now there's maybe hundreds and hundreds or thousands. So you go from this huge number and you only want to interview maybe eight people for the first round phone screen. And then you want to whittle it down to four that you'd bring in for a first round interview and two that you'd bring in for a second round interview. So how do I go from a thousand down to eight. And I'm going to use my applicant tracking systems to get rid of a whole bunch of people that, that don't seem like they're a very good fit. But there's still going to be a pretty good number of people out there that, you know, pass, got past that 80% mark. So how do I decide? If somebody internal to the company says, I spoke to this person and I think we should take a look at them, pull their resume, their resume will get looked at. You might not get a call, but you can be sure that your resume will get a look. Um, and, and, you know, eight people do that. Eight people have networked and gotten a connection that, that you know, says a good word. Um, and those are the eight people who are going to get a call. So if you're applying to things and you're not getting anywhere with it, you need to be spending more time networking and doing those informational interviews. And, and it really, they're not that, that bad. And, and actually they can be quite fascinating uh, once, you, once you start doing them. And, and again, you're not asking for a job, you're just asking for perspective. You're asking, you're curious about their story. You're curious about learning more about the culture of that organization or some of the exciting things that are, are that that organization's working on, what that company's perspective is on, on the next five years coming out of this pandemic. Um, so you're just being curious, but that the act of being curious oftentimes makes you a really good candidate for that organization and that's all that's necessary. So, so start making those connections because every, every, you know, C, uh, chief human resources officer and chief people officer on that call, every one of them said the key to getting a job right now is networking. So, it's so um, I'm going to share my screen one more time with you and we're going to go back to LinkedIn because I, this is the coolest thing in LinkedIn and, and so many people don't even know it's there. So patience while I share my screen one more time. Um, so if you go into LinkedIn and in the search box, you type in University of Missouri. Uh, did I misspell something? Yeah. 
Yeah, there we go. There we go. So you go to our our lovely page on LinkedIn and click on the alumni here. And it gives you this amazing sorting tool. So you can go in here and say, okay, I'm interested in staying in Kansas City, so I want to talk to an alum in Kansas City. There's 40,000 UMKC alums using LinkedIn. So I'm going to click on that. And then it shows where they work. And then I'm thinking, okay, I really want to work for um, American Century. 110 people. Um, and then if I click next, I can see the type of work they do and what they studied. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I studied computer science. So I want to see if there's any computer science alumni at American Century, which would be my dream company to work for. And then look, there they are. It's fantastic. So then I can say, oh, all right, you know, I'm, I'm interested in network engineering. So this guy, Gary, maybe I'll scope him out. And I look at his experience and I see when he graduated and I think, well, that might be interesting. He might actually have a pretty interesting story to tell. I click on message. I send him a quick message in LinkedIn saying, hi, Gary. I am a fellow UMKC alum and, and I'm exploring new options and new careers and trying to learn about new industries. Love to set up a time to chat with you about your experience at American Century and see what happens. Worst case scenario, nothing. They don't respond. Worst case scenario is that they don't respond. Best case scenario, they write back in a few minutes and say, sure, want to set up a Zoom call and when are you free? And, and you're off and running. So it's super easy. And then at the end of every one of those conversations, your, your comment should be, this has been so interesting. And you know what? I was particularly interested in what you had to say about X, Y, or Z. If I wanted to learn more about that, do you have any suggestions on who I should talk to? And they'll give you a couple names and they'll usually say, yeah, I'll make an introduction for you. And, and then you're off and you're talking to more people. And once you've had those conversations, a job is just right on the horizon. Um, it, is, it is the best way to find a job. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing and come on back. Um, yeah, I told you I would, I would kind of harp on the networking thing and I'm gonna harp on the networking thing. Um, it is, it's gonna be your, your best friend. Any other, any other questions? All right, I might screen share one more time. Um, and give you the slide that has my contact information. Except, of course, I forgot to put my contact information on it, but let me just quickly do that and then you can, um, I know sometimes, I was actually just saying to Katie before we got started, so often people are hesitant to ask questions about their careers in sort of a public forum. So um, perfectly fine to just reach out to me individually. Um, sorry. I think I'd be better at this whole Zoom thing because, and these sort of meetings, because I do this all the time and, and yet here I am being a putz and making you watch me do this. There is so another I have, question on the chat after um, I can read it while you have your screen shared, if that's easier. Um, um, yeah, so I have an unusual last name. Um, so when you're, you're typing out my email, email. Remember, there's two R's, one before the P and one after. People usually forget one of them. Um, but feel free to reach out to me and happy to take a look at your, your resume. Let me know if you're having a hard time getting into JobScan. 
Um, if you just want some tips or tricks, if you want some contacts for networking, that's what we're here for. And, and we really want to help you as you, as you make these changes. So Tess, there's two questions in the chat. Um, first one is, if you want a job in government, would you network in the same way? I would, uh, I would network in the same way. Um, and, and applying on government sites is a whole nother beast. Um, it's like more detail is always better. And normally I would tell people your resume shouldn't be more than two pages. And that is not the case when applying for a government position. It can be as long as it needs to be just so that, it, although I will say that the, the whole idea of, of using something like JobScan because with government positions, they really, really, really are looking for somebody who kind of ticks all of the boxes that, that they've indicated. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that, that you're a really good match. And if that means you have to talk about things that were years and years ago, then you, you need to go back further in your resume and you need to give more detail. Um, but it, it also definitely, it's, um, Networking is, is a pretty powerful thing, even with government jobs. And then a question about job scan. Uh, do we schedule a meeting with someone in your office to view how a resume measures up in job scan? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you can go into job scan on your own. It's in its jobscan.co, not, not dot com. So it's J O B S C A N dot C O. Um, so you can go in there and, and play around with it on your own. Um, but oftentimes, and we see this a lot, and students will be able to get it to a certain point and then, then they just sort of plateau out and, or alumni, I'm sorry, I, I refer to everybody these days as students. But um, um, so if, if you're having a hard time getting it sort of super tailored and, and meeting that, that 80 or 90% match, Schedule a time. We'll set up a Zoom meeting and, and we'll, we'll walk you through it. We'll take a look at your resume and make some suggestions. Um, you might have a hard time kind of seeing how you would talk about some of your past experience to fit the job you want. But again, we have so much experience doing this that we probably can see things that you, you don't automatically see. So absolutely. Great. I think we covered all the questions that are in the chat. Um, Tess, thank you so much for doing this today. Um, this was uh, very my pleasure. Very helpful. So um, I will share out, I will also send out an email with Tess's contact information in case you want to just have the, the easy link to the email um, so that way you have it. But thank you all for attending today. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day, guys.